gaining life's unspeakable advantage. Now, the good thing about this year's lesson or the layout is that I'm going to give you a weekly layout. It will be very detailed as it relates to God's visitations with me in advance. That does not mean I will get a chance to deal with all of the points as they are listed. They are there to equip you in a very detailed manner apart from my lesson. What I have taught you in times past is that all of you have what's called a tailor-made anointing. You have an anointing abiding in you, and you need not that any man teach you, for that spirit is of Christ. It is the spirit that Christ talked to you about. He will lead you and guide you into all truth. Bring to your remembrance whatsoever God hath said. God has said. Now, he wants to amplify revelation so that it is equipment for your right now situation. That's why we take the information that's stored and as we pray over it and meditate, God then turns it into you, what, we, what I call uniform truth. It's a truth that you can wear because it's tailored just for you. It will deal with all the several details of your life. And that's why this year, make sure your email is with the church. I think um, uh, Minister Cynthia Steele is where you want to make sure your email is deposited or get with any of the elders or call the office or you can actually submit it on the website. But make sure we have your email so that uh, relative to each lesson during the month, you can have it and you and your family can study along with us. And you'll be amazed at how God will take a lesson that your pastor preaches and turn it into all the revelation and the power from him you'll need to exchange with your month. Now, here's the other side of the good thing there. When a word comes from God, it is prophetic, not just revelation, it's prophetic. It sees into the future or the future scape of where we are headed. Now, the natural eye cannot see that far, but your spirit, you will be amazed. Vision gives us clarity of sight, and it's the ability to see through the mind of Christ what's going to happen next. And so even though you're preparing yourself with the lesson that you get foundationally, you're going to find out, you say, wow, how did we get this lesson this far in advance? And not, not knowing what we were about to face. Well, the spirit knows how many things? All things. And he searches all things, yea, and even the deep things of God. And so I spend time with God so that you will not just have a word out of the Bible, but you will have a revelation for your situation now. Thanks. Amen. Come on one more time. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise. Today we're talking about gaining life's unspeakable advantage. In Romans chapter 8, 37, the apostle said that yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Our primary passages for this series of lessons are found in Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, and verse 18. Also Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 18. And then last but not least, our primary lesson focus will come from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Amen. Now, <clears throat> one of the premier joys or premier joys of accepting Jesus as Savior is the more than conqueror status that we gain immediately. We gain that status immediately. Knowing or remembering where Jesus is in times of trouble is the determining factor in whether we worry about what's going to happen or whether we are at peace about what is going to happen. 
Many times, not knowing how to locate God in adversity leaves us vulnerable to fear. God, I just don't know where you are. Can't, can't sense your presence. It feels like I'm by myself. You put us on this boat. You went up yonder way. And since we've been here, a storm has arisen. Where are you? And I know some of you are not so adjusted to simply lay it out like that, where you say, Lord, where are you? You say, where in the he heck are you? Oh, and I know y'all thought I was going to cross words <laughs> because that's what you do. But now, realistically, we wonder, and then we put a great deal of emphasis and emphatic energy in the discussion because when we need help, we need help. And help that we need right now ain't no good if it comes later on. Where were you when I needed you most? One of the things that really helped me context God and his omniscience or his omnipresence is that you remember when Jesus had this good friend, friend named Lazarus, and they were so good in, in being friends till his family thought that if anything happened to Lazarus, one thing we could count on is that Jesus going to be there. And sometimes what natural thinking does is it induces us to believe that just because we have a friend, they're going to always be there if we go through anything adverse or difficult. Not, that doesn't determine friendship. Jesus looked at his disciples and said, I'm glad I wasn't there. <laughs> Didn't sound good. It sounds kind of cold to a church society, doesn't it? You mean to tell me my, my good buddy, my bestest friend, don't think he's supposed to be there when I need him? And I'm near the point of what? Yeah. That, but see, the other thing that you have to understand about this relationship we have with God is that being there may not be as it is spiritually or be spiritually as it appears to be naturally. See, naturally speaking, we only see what's happening to us from a mortal, physical, natural perspective. But man, when you're spiritual minded, you can see what's going on behind the scene. You see the root causes of things. You see the purpose of everything that is happening now. That's why it's very important to lean to his understanding and not your own. Now, it's a critical lesson because clearly it's our ability to see spiritually that unveils our hearts and our minds to help us discern God's presence. Like depending upon our natural parents, I use this adage uh, during Bible study, knowing God is present in our struggles is comforting. It's kind of like uh, since you're familiar with I-20, some of you, you're in the car in the front. And you're almost out of gas. In fact, the hand is doing like this, and now it's quit. It's just kind of like nothing else to lick. And you almost want to panic, but your parents are driving in the car behind you. How does that feel? How do you register that? a sense of comfort, a sense of security. Why? Because you know where your parents are. And one thing you know about your parents is that they're not going to leave you discomforted. Are y'all with me today? Amen. See, the problem with us, spiritually speaking, is that when we deal with dilemma, we don't know where God is. And because we're not spiritual-minded, we haven't rehearsed the things of God. We haven't learned to make God tangible in a spiritual way so that we always sense his presence. And because of that, we find ourselves worrying. And he said it's a sin to worry. You know why? Because it's a sin to not know where he is. <laughs> He's already located himself for you. He said greater is he that is than he that is. So look at your neighbor and tell him he's actually closer than my physical parents. But I've got to learn how to make his presence more tangible, more tangible, more tangible. So it's critical then because this adds to us life's unspeakable advantage. Now, in, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, it speaks of a time when vision was scarce. 
It was rare. No open vision in those days, the Bible says, which is vitally important because revelation from God is what gives us what we call uh, societal direction. So you can almost tell to some degree, y'all listen at me now, I'm going to say this, it's kind of harsh. You can almost tell if the Congress that governs the United States has vision from God because anybody that has to do what we call random purposing, <laughs> doing things at random, they don't have a plan. And because they don't have a plan, it is indicative that there is no vision. When God gives vision, he says, write it down. Make it what? Planable. Make the steps pliable. Make it something legible so that everyone can be governed by it. That's restraint. And then everyone is able to perform according to it. That's the discipline of behavior. Now, we don't just do, but we do something that corresponds with what God is expecting from us. Is that clear? Amen. Now, turn with me to Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Because these passages, and I'm reading from the Amplified, gives us the four standards to an advantage. Now, I've already said this, we are already more than what? Conquerors through Christ. Say I'm more than a conqueror. And since I'm more than a conqueror now, I need this thing to start manifesting in my life in a way this year that I don't just have to wonder about being more. I need to know I'm more at all times. I need to sense and know that I am more than a conqueror. And so these four standards of the advantage will help us to get there. Now, while you're turning, <clears throat> chapter 3, verses 1 through 10, Reading from the Amplified, let me say to you that this chapter is one of the most profound in all of Proverbs because it argues to persuade us to be principle driven <clears throat> and it provides wisdom for directions in life. Now, God has entrusted us to be stewards of four things. Uh, put, your, put your hand up, put, your, put four fingers up. Steward, say, I'm a steward from now on over truth. Time, talent, and treasure. Come on. I am a steward called by God over truth, time, talent, and treasure. These things I steward as a citizen of the kingdom of God. Okay, that's very important uh, because these four words sum up the Christian priorities. Our life is actually supposed to be about serving and sharing Jesus, sharing, serving others and sharing Jesus with others on every turn, in every front. Now, I want you to notice as we proceed today in these 10 passages, I'll read them and then I'll divide them into four standards, one for each week so that you and your family will know how to keep building on the foundation of abounding, God's abounding presence this year. There are two P's reflected in each standard. The first P regards the principle. Now, whenever you see the word principle, understand, principle suggests God's instruction for me. It's God telling me what he expects from me. Now, listen at this, this is critical. Because ain't nothing wrong with your relationship, but you spend all that time together and not taking enough time to be principle driven. What's principle driven? Tell your partner up front. Say, I need to know up front. Say, we need to establish expectations up front. Understand something about God. He never holds an individual accountable to anything without first making them aware of his expectations. He said, if I don't come, you have a cloak for your sin. In other words, you have permission to keep treating me like you do. You, you have permission to keep handling things from your own logic. You've got permission to just do things in and of your own opinion. But when I come, in other words, when I unveil my expectations to you, 
then you are required to function accordingly or you understand immediately that you have offended the premise of being in relationship with me. Now you see that? See, we walk around blaming people of disrespecting us and they never knew what respecting us consisted of. So if they don't know the limits, they just be, they have a right to be themselves. They laugh and talk, they joke. Uh, they call people names. They just talk about your mama. And they don't know if they talk about your mama. They just what? They just messed up. They done jumped the broom too quick. Talk about my mama. We've gone from peace to problem. Amen. So, but, but, but if I don't know it, you know, you let me talk about your hair, you laugh. You let me talk about your bald head, you laugh. You let me talk about going, you're going great, how your body done change, you laugh. You let me talk about all these things about how you fell and how you slipped and, and how you were embarrassed and you never get bothered. But then when I talk about your mama, you want to fight. You see that? So say this with me, orientation, orientation. is proper cure for every situation. Don't blame me for disrespecting you if we never had the conversation. Oh boy. Got you there, didn't I? Now, I'll say this while we're in that, on that. Now, this will help you because this is the Holy Spirit. I didn't plan any of this. Um, that's why the most common sin we commit in the body of Christ and in the world over is the sin of trespass. And that's why Jesus said, when you pray, forgive men their trespasses because we are forever trespassing, crossing each other's boundaries. You see that? Why? Because we don't orientate individuals that live close to us and then we don't orientate people who are in environments to be shared with us over time. See, that's why there's so much offense even on the job. Stop those people and tell them, look, I don't deal with black-white conversation. I don't discuss politics. I don't, do see, that's the way your bishop was, see. They knew when I walked in the room, okay, well, bishop, uh, when I wasn't bishop there on the job, you know, I'm just bishop at the church. But on the job, I'm finest. But finest don't get in those discussions there unless I'm talking with someone intelligently about it, intentionally, intelligently, intentionally, you hear me now? Because that's what we've decided and we don't just take shots at each other at random because you can offend the person you are supposed to be getting the job done with to the point where they leave you to yourself. Amen. So do it at home, do it in your friendships, do it on the job, it's good to let people know that you stand for nothing, for, uh -oh, for something. <laughs> Martin Luther King Jr. said, in fact, he said, a man not willing to stand for something will fall for anything. And look at somebody in Portland and say, is that you? <laughs> Come on, not me, certainly not Bishop. I don't even think you can hang around me long and, 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 and keep growing in a way that you stand for nothing. You can't do that. I, I'll rub off on you. You got to stand, you got to wear your sensitivities on your your sleeves, but you're going to stand for something. Amen. All right. And see, here's another thing. Your presence ought to be so well stated, the aura of the anointing that lives in you, that people get a sense that I ought to be uncomfortable if I attempt to do that around him. So if people apologize for cursing around you, don't say, oh, there's no problem. Just shut up. Just say, okay. It's okay for them to just say, okay, stop taking it back. All oh, you ain't got to do it because then you keep telling them, okay. They say, oh, you all right, huh? They go from one thing to the next. So state your boundaries. The Bible said when a man's ways please God, he makes his enemies be at peace with him. And the reason why some of your enemies are not at peace with you is because you never, you see that now? Please God by stating his cause as your promotional stance. This is how I stand. It preserves relationships. But you don't need to call and find us about that because I know he, he ain't up to that already. So we, we're not even going to call him. You see that? Daniel. And I, I know we didn't plan into this, but this is the new year. Daniel. You remember what happened with Daniel? Uh, they all come together. They knew right off the bat. King, here's how we get him. 
All you got to do is tell him to bow when you play uh, the psaltery and the harp and all these, make all these uh, uh, noises. He ain't going to bow Amen. because he submitted to someone other than you. They knew Daniel's stance. Are you listening to me? They knew the Hebrew boys what? Stand. And the Hebrew boys and Daniel, none of them had any problems in making sure they knew what they represented. They don't need to try to even feed them. They ain't going to eat your food, king. So they contrived easily. But let me tell you something. When you make your stand for God, he already got your back. Amen. Throw me in the lion's den. I'm coming out. Come on here. And you're going to fall in there, get eaten, and I'm going to lay down on one with a pillow, like a pillow, and cross my legs. Throw me in the fire. And you mess around and get too close. You're going to get burnt, and I'm not even going to smell like smoke. You see that? Because my stand was already orientated, stated. See, go home this year. Think about what is an offense to you. Ask God for how to manifest it and then pleasantly make it known. One check. If it doesn't align with righteousness, take it back because you are not your own any longer. You've been bought with the price. Your duty is to glorify God in your bodies, which are God's. Y'all got that? Tell me that wasn't wisdom. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand of praise. That's what some of us need. No ease. See, that, that don't give you permission to go home and say, well, I'm this way, and I'm this way, and I'm this way. If it don't line up with righteousness, shut up. Because self has to die. <laughs> Amen? All right. Okay. Whew, whew, whew. Okay, this ain't working fast enough. I, got, I, I need to get a break before I <laughs> pass out of here. All right. Thank you, baby. Oh, shit. Let me get my coat back here. Get my coat. Uh-uh, pull it up. Yeah, I'm hot. I'm really hot. All right, so I'm show all my mother. <laughs> shit. Girl, girlfriend ain't right. Y'all, come on now. Y'all got Now, see, she got me blushing. I'm going to do like this right here. <laughs> Mama ain't right. <laughs> what a wife, what a wife. Now, the first principle that I'm going to carry you over today for this first week is that we must be constant in duty because this will ensure each of us that we are happy this year. Verses 1 through 4 gives us this principle because a misguided, here, here's what you might want to write down. A misguided heart equals an unhappy life. See, to help you really preach to yourself early, can I tell you that when you sit down this year to look over the landscape of your life, if you see anything that makes you unhappy, it's because in that thing, you are misguided. It ain't what you're looking at, it's how you see it. God has already provided a remedy to give us peace that lends credence to happiness and it will manifest in a happy life. You got it now? It's deeper than happy wife, happy life. <laughs> Some of us ain't married, praise the Lord. Standard number two. We must learn to depend upon God because this will ensure that we are safe. We are safe, verses 5 and 6. I need you to understand here that self-dependence equals low security. Please write that down. Self-dependence equals low, L-O-W, or no <laughs> security. Self-dependence equals low security. The third standard, we must be constant in reverently fearing God to ensure we are healthy. So I've given you three standards already. The first standard is to make us what? Happy. The second standard is to make us safe. The third standard here then is to ensure that we are healthy. Verses 7 and 8. 
healthy. And then the fourth standard, we must be committed to serve God with our estates, the surest way to be wealthy. The surest way to be wealthy, verses 9 and 10. Now, this is a critical lesson because if I work from the bottom up, you'll see by week four that God wants me to be wealthy. It is God's highest will that I prosper and be in health even as my so notice he puts that word soul prosperous to because all the way back to the first standard. So he wants me to be wealthy, but what good is wealth without health? See, I'm backing up now. He wants me to be healthy so I can enjoy my wealth because this is um, uh, a privilege that God has given us in society. He has blessed us to be healthy and wealthy. So he wants us to be wealthy. He wants us to be healthy, but then he wants us to be what? Safe. Now, if we ain't safe, health ain't no good. Wealth ain't no good. I suppose uh, uh, the second person in command in Iran thought that because he was uh, wealthy and probably healthy that he was safe. But the Bible literally teaches that if God don't watch your house, the laborers are watching it, but uh, in, in vain. If God don't keep the city, the city won't be kept. So we need to shout, thank you for security, Lord. Thank you for security. <laughs> See, that's why we simply say again, self-dependence is low security. Low security. You see that? So here I am again. He wants me to be wealthy, but he wants me to be healthy, and he wants me to be what? Safe so I can be happy. Now, some of you don't know the real privilege of being in America because you've never traveled the seas. You've never gone to other countries. But I'll tell you something. I remember the first time we stepped foot across the border in Mexico years ago. It is amazing how beautiful San Antonio is, but just a few miles down the road. When you cross the border, everything that poverty has to offer you is suggested in a commercial way to you. And these people live in that reality all the time. Are you listening to me? So we got a lot to give God thanks for, even though sometimes we stray from the belief that all is well in our country. Amen. In fact, let's just take a moment and give God some praise. For keeping us safe in America. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And so today, since I only, only have a few minutes left to deal with just one standard, I'm going to talk to you about standard number one. First, be constant in duty, which is the surest way to be happy. Somebody say, I want to be happy. All year long this year, I want to be happy. Yeah. Now, the first standard is primarily about adjusting your heart in order to recalibrate your mind. Adjusting your heart in order to recalibrate your mind. How many times have you allowed another person or a situation to be in control of your peace? Jesus gave you his peace, and this peace is supposed to live in your spirit. It's supposed to be so abundant that it, it, watch this, overflows into your soul, and it's supposed to be so abundant in your soul that it flourishes in your natural life. But what happens is, when you start walking by sight other than faith, when you walk by sight other than faith, when you walk by sight and you are driven by the pulse of your natural senses, you allow what you see to dictate what really be. And when what you see dictate what really be, you are limited. And whenever you are limited, the mind over time starts to feeling stressed because you start running out of options and you run out of alternatives. And the next thing you know, as good as things are going for you, you start feeling depressed inside of yourself. Loss of happiness. So depression says, I might as well stop, leave this off, quit, just give up because it ain't working out anyhow. But just know, to walk by faith is victorious. We are more than conquerors through Christ. 
And so if we see things from a Christ perspective, we're never limited. We're always uh, filled with alternatives and options so that we can bring change, favorable change to our environments. And so it must be clear that everything associated with the kingdom begins with Matthew 6, 33. First, seek the kingdom of God and his way of doing and being right. And all these things that prompt worry among common folk shall be added unto you. Are you listening to me? So it begins with Matthew 6, 33 to align our thoughts and to align our feelings and then so to align our behaviors with God's righteousness. Now in our first estate, before the fall, we had fellowship, you remember? We had communion with God. We had consciousness. In other words, we knew where things were and how to adjust. And then last but not least, we had intuition. These are the three products of spirit life. But immediately after the fall, our association became more soulical. You remember? I told you the soul has what? Five chambers. The spirit has three. There's three products of the spirit. There are five chambers in the soul. The soul has a will. It has intellect. It has disposition. It has feelings and it has thoughts. Now, if you're not careful, you'll be governed by your soul. You'll be saying things like, I don't feel good. I, I just feel like something's wrong. Just, it just don't seem like things are right. Look at, just, look at somebody tell them, get out of your head. Because now your senses are dictating to your soul how to feel. Yeah, and that's not the way you're supposed to live. Now, let me explain something to you about this dilemma we're in before I proceed. See, here's the problem. In the first estate, before the fall, you were so susceptible and so governed by three things, by consciousness, by communion, and by intuition, that you had a relationship with God that gave you continual peace, a continual flow of peace. So you lived in shalom, wholesomeness. There was nothing missing. There was nothing broken. You had access to everything around you. You could enjoy the fruit thereof. You could eat, you could drink, you could enjoy the fruit thereof. You could have more than enough. You had access to everything, everything you ever desire. You would call it, you would see it. You could call it, you would see it. This is the initiation component of faith. You lived in faith because faith is the force and the function of God. So it was easy for you before Adam fell to have the kind of relationship with God that kept you in communion with him come on kept and because you were in communion with him you were constant in knowing or intuitive about everything you knew exactly what needed to be done you remember God set all the beasts in the field brought them before Adam to see what he would call them and whatever he called them that was the name thereof come on he said monkey and the monkey started to act in that he said snake the snake started to come on he said eagle the eagle hey, come on everything he called came into existence according to what his word because we understand through faith that the worlds were framed by the word of God so we were in constant communion with God we were always conscious of God and we had intuition that kept us knowing what to do next but as soon as man fell the first thing he did was lost his communion with God, fell subject to his soul, and now, see the first man Adam was, a, uh, the first man Adam was uh, a living soul. The last man Adam is a quickening spirit. See, so Jesus had to die, come back and show us how to become what? Spiritual again. Where we used to need or would have needed to work to become solical, now we have to work to become spiritual. Did I help you with that now? See, you've been trying to figure out why is it that my mind is susceptible to evil and I can't get rid of it. But then when I do something intentional relative to truth, I forget. I got to keep working because now you are a living soul that's trying to walk in the spirit. That's good, isn't it? That's why Paul said, when I would do good, 
Eve was present with me. What I would, that do I not. What I would not, that's what I found myself doing. See, so all wretched, he called himself wretched. In other words, I'm caught in this gulf where I really want to impress God, but shoot. Every day, I have the same dilemma. Sometimes three times a day, four times a day. And if the truth be told, sometimes ten times a day. And moreover, if the truth be actually told, it's all day. <laughs> when I'm not striving to be spiritual, I go right back natural. Am I helping somebody? That's the problem. It's not just your problem. Let me help you. It's all of our problems. That's what we're contending with daily. This is the apostle talking at the epitome of his own reference. He's telling us, this is what I still deal with as the apostle. And if I got to kill my body and beat it black and blue every day, and I'm your apostle, how much more do you have to do the same thing? Paul said, for me, first thing I do every day is get up and die. I die daily. I live a life of self-denial. I intentionally convince myself that I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Whenever I fail to remind myself that I'm crucified with him, I forget I'm supposed to be dead. And when I forget I'm supposed to be dead, I start acting out of my head. And my head makes me selfish because because it only tells me things to do to look out for my own self-interest. My, Come on here. <laughs> so it's important then, this first standard. I got to get out of my brain. I got to get out of my head and, and entrust myself to what God said. So let's go to verse 1. Notice then, the reason why this was profoundly necessary is because I wanted to show you that what has made you a victim, the Bible said the creature in Romans 8, the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly. You didn't willingly make yourself subject to vanity, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. In other words, God said, I know that wasn't your way, but you died in Adam. <laughs> he was your daddy. Since Adam was your father, come on, your grandfather, your great, everybody tried. Some of you didn't get to meet your granddaddy. Can I tell you who, who all of our grandfather was? A D A M A D A M. Oh, y'all messed that up. <laughs> I just did that to wake y'all up. <laughs> A damn was my. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> that's my granddaddy. You laughing, but that's yours too. <laughs> you know what a damn does? It stops the flow of blessings that were designed to come with ease. I know y'all thought I was just making a joke, didn't you? <laughs> I know religion ain't gonna ever take his name and separate it like that. Those are two syllable words, a damn. That's why he called him Adam. He damned up everything, <laughs> okay. All right, that's all right. That's all right, I, got you. I bet some of you got new meaning for this week, right, discussion. Notice what he says, since it pertains to the heart. Let's read it together, everybody. Verse 1 through 4. I want you to read with me. If you got the Amplified, let's read together in concert. Ready? Go. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my command. See that? See that? Now we are struggling to remember principal teaching. You see the difference? Yesterday, we would have had to struggle to remember wrong. Now, we have to struggle to remember what? Right. right. See that? Even though we intend, he says, my son, notice the terms he uses. Do not forget my teaching. But then he says, let your heart do what? Keep my commandments. In other words, give your heart permission. Let it flow in the rhythm of your life because it's important. Here's the first. So you see the principle now. The first P, then the second P. For length of days and years of life worth living and tranquility and prosperity, the wholeness of life blessing, will they what? And all these, notice proverbial wisdom always says, uh, the blessing of the Lord maketh rich and added what? How much sorrow? How much sorrow? How much sorrow? 
So say it adds no sorrow. So if what we feel we've been blessed with is causing us sorrow, there's a possibility we've added to ourselves and God hasn't done it. Let me keep moving. You'll figure that out. Verse 3. Let's read. Do not let mercy and kindness and what? Truth do what? Now, now watch this. Notice they'll say they'll leave you. See, some of you got to go to work tomorrow. Some of you got to go to work today. As soon as you get in that environment, you got to remind yourself that I'm different. Now, you can't be there just to make a statement for you and expect to see exceeding and abundant blessings. If you want to see bless, blessings to the overflow, understand the environment. You're going to be challenged. Say, I'm going to be challenged, but I cannot let mercy, kindness, and truth leave me. Now, here's the distinguishing mark. If I let it leave me, I'll represent myself. But if I keep it with me, I'll represent God. Now, if I represent God, God now has been put to force and he has to defend my cause and he said watch this do all things heartily as unto the Lord guess what if you ain't got if you're doing treating the boss like he's the Lord check this out looking beyond the boss God's going to use the boss to bless you in ways that the boss never even considered I'm telling you, you can get the kind of blessing where, where the king is surrounded with all these servants that's supposed to know how to do it, and he ends up looking inside of a jailhouse to find your J named Joseph up in there because you got the stuff that the king needs. Come on here. Even though you in jail, you in prison, you're the last person that should be considered. But because you grace with what this situation is causing calling for, you got just what the king needs. That king is going to sin for you. Look at your neighbor tell him you get ready to come out because of what you got. <laughs> You've been had a deposit in your life all this time and never knew what it was for. Well, I'm here to tell you 2020 is going to unveil what your purpose is. And God's getting ready to prosper your hand. I decree it. If I be a man of God, you better catch this. You're going to be blessed in ways you never considered this year. Say, I got just what I need to be blessed. Because I walk by faith and not by sight. <laughs> yeah. So do not let mercy and truth and kindness leave you. Instead, these are the qualities that define you. Say, they define me. When you go home and your partner got the, got the wrong attitude or your children ain't acting right, don't let mercy and kindness. See, the first thing you do, you want to wear your authority. Didn't I sit? I told, just walk, you got to ask yourself at all times, how would Jesus handle this? I ain't going to tell you one more time. As you don't forgot, as if you don't forgot their kids. Paul said, when I was a child, guess what I did? I act like a child. Because I thought like a child, I talked like a child. Come on here. In other words, when I was a duck, I quack. <laughs> Whatever children do, that's what children are susceptible to. So, so don't expect for them to be grown over night. If you do, run. Okay. If they become grown overnight, run. I give you permission. Hello. But he says, do not let mercy and kindness and truth leave you. Instead, these, let these qualities define you. Then he tells you to do something. Bind them. How? Securely around what? Your neck. So find what Jesus found. Everybody read it. Favor and what? High esteem where? Now look up for a minute. Let me tell you this and I'll jump on in the lesson. I'll finish it. The reason some of you are not getting favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man is because, here we go, if God don't convict the man, then the man won't be convinced to favor you. So sometimes what you forget, see the back, for instance, here's a convincer. Give, and it shall be what? Given unto you. Watch where, watch where God, say, say, let's see where God is headed. Come on, say, let's see where God is headed. 
Okay, so let the quote again. He said, give and what? It shall be given unto you. How? Good measure. How? Press down. How? Shaken together and what? Running over shall. Yes. Shall who? Yes. No, I thought it's I thought God. Shall who? Yes. So now your expectations after you release a seed is supposed to go strictly from watch this from the seed to God because God then takes the expectation and tells the man to go find you get in your Bible <laughs> yeah but now he didn't tell you the man he said shall men look at your neighbor tell him he's sending enough to make me to give me multiplied revenue yeah one seed can release multiplied let's get some practice one seed can release multiplied revenue you get some come on get some practice so one seed can can reproduce multiplied revenue how many of you need more than enough Come on, one seed can reproduce what? Multiply. Y'all ain't singing with me. One seed can produce. So I heard somebody say one word, multiply. I, I need to hear both words. One seed can re can can release. Multiply, multiply what? Multiply what? All right, all right. Y'all chill. Before y'all send me up a tree real quick. Y'all tell them, say, we got to get this. Now watch this, watch this. Oh. Now, let's calm back down. I've read you the four verses to this standard. I need you to notice the first verse was the principle. The second verse was the promise. The third verse was the principle. The fourth verse was the promise. So here's what you got to understand. The first part, God is saying, you do. Because I've already done. So in order for you to get what I have, you got to do what I ask. I call it the doodle -doo principle. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Y'all going to remember that one too, right? Come on, everybody say, that's the doodle -doo principle. You do. He do. That's all right. I'm going to give you some language for this year, huh? Some of y'all already going to be just laughing around the house, but you're going to remember this year. I'm, baby, what you do? I'm doing the doo doo principle, baby. <laughs> I'm doing, taking care of my part. God done done his part. All right, here we go. Now, shh. Since purpose is the central principle of life, this principle instructs us to live a life of communion with God in order to gain life's unspeakable advantage. Throughout 2020 this year, the year of double grace and vision from God, it's important that we set up God's principles as rules to govern ourselves in everything. Now in order to do this, we must become intimately acquainted with them to avoid forgetting them. You see how he says, do not forget. Look at your neighbor, tell him so, don't forget. So, so to, to stop forgetting, you got to set up some reminders. I think I heard that annoying sound in my home, and I hear it every morning. Jerry has this alarm, and it goes off, and it just creeps all through the house. It's a funny sound. I'm like, what? But he really chose an alarm <laughs> because it'll get you up. If nothing else but to tell him, cut that thing off. But my point again is, Understand the mind. Even though it functions involuntarily, it don't need your permission because it thinks on average from 62,000 uh, to 80,000 thoughts a day. That's 2,800 to 3,200 thoughts, watch this, a minute. And since you have all that kind of involuntary commotion going on inside of your mind, here we go, you got to be intentional. Say, I got to become intentional. Okay. Only your mouth can shut your mind down and direct its thoughts. See, only my mouth can keep my mind in alignment. So when my mind gets out of righteousness, I put it back in alignment with my mouth. See, it don't matter how good your situation is. Some of you see, you need this kind of ministry. That's why I don't need to hurry because you struggle with this fight all the time. 
Amen. Okay, for instance, let me give you another. I, I'm going to say this because I sense the Holy Spirit. Okay, you strive, for instance, uh, some of you who are newlyweds, you're married, you, you plan, you want to have some children. And you do what it takes to get them. And then the first thing the enemy does is try to make you think of all the ways you can lose your child. I ain't never been a woman, but I guarantee you, you deal with that. Am I right? What? And he tries to make you sensitive and tries to make you fragile and he tries to keep you disturbed and unsettled because he wants to affect what's influencing you because he knows that certain thoughts, if they linger, will become what's called an abiding presence. And when they become an abiding presence, they gain the kind of influence in you that can impact your external life. You hear me now? So you have to deal with that thought and bring it captive to the obedience of Christ with your mouth. Tell it I'm healthy. I will give birth to a healthy child. Come on here. My child will have, are y'all listening to me? Yes. You, you got to tell everything it will be normal. In fact, they will be super normal. <laughs> They're going to be anointed. They're going to discover their destiny early and just tell it, tell it, tell it, tell it and keep walking. See, if you cave in to inferior thoughts, you give birth to inferior life. The influence is in the thinking. As he thinketh, so is he. And so it's important, see, because huh, our wills and our affections must be committed to principles in order to conform our hearts. This is not for our heads, but our hearts must be committed as in the Ark of the Covenant. You know, in the Ark of the Covenant, they had both tablets. One was for the head, the other was for the heart. See that? So it's important for you to put both tablets in the Ark. Am I clear? In spiritual matters, it is the heart that regulates our sight. Especially spiritual sight. Herein, spiritual sight confirms our spirit mind, making us stewards of God's words. Ephesians 5, 15 and 16 says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. So here we go. Say, I got to see like he, so I can see where he be. Now, I can open my natural eyes and tell where my natural parents are, but I can't open my natural eyes and tell where God is. That's the dilemma. So now I've got to become more spirit-minded. If I walk in the spirit, I'll stop fulfilling the lust of my flesh. I'll know where spiritual things are. Even though these angels are around me and they are celestial creatures, they are invisible to me. My naked eye won't let me see them. My naked eye, my eye sees things as they are, but my faith sees things as they are supposed to be. So I walk by faith and not by sight. Even when I can't see it, then I can sense it, not, not sight and touch. You see that? Not smell and taste. I can sense it spiritually. I become conscious that God is present. Now, let me make this tangible and I'll close. How many of you ever been in a situation where you find yourself in a room or alone, but you feel a presence. You sense a presence in the room, like something just walked in the room. And not evil, but a presence, a force. Now, in most cases, you sense this presence because this is the Holy Spirit's way of trying to commune with you and take your mind into a chamber that you're not accustomed to. He's there, and he knows that you can't see him. Now, some of you, let me take your mind for a minute. You saw the picture uh, that used to come on called the Invisible Man. In, anybody? Anybody seen the Invisible Man? You remember when the Invisible Man wanted to be seen, he wrapped himself up and put on a hat. Right? So now he walked around with a coat on and some glasses on, and people thought that he was just a man being uh, that just come out of surgery. So they would talk with him and laugh with him and everything. But all of a sudden, you start trying to do something to him, and you mess. Now you could hit you in an amazing, you could hit him as long as he was wrapped. 
But boy, you can't hear what you can't see. <laughs> when you go celestial, you go full spiritual. Now, it's not easy to detect where the individual that was wrapped has now moved. Okay, now bring your minds back into the room. Angelic presence is what we call ministering spirits. They are agents waiting for you to open your mouth to, oh my God, to give them an assignment so that they can start manufacturing things for your life. One of the detriments of being religious over righteous is that you don't speak like you need to speak. For what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thine heart. What word? That is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made. Are you listening to me? Confession is made unto you. Are you confessing your salvation? Are you confessing and calling what you believe in God for? He has already put a warehouse in heavenly places together and said I blessed you with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly realm. Now all you got to do, we who have the God kind of faith, we call what be not as though it were. What do you have permission to call? I'm the head, not the tail. Come on. I'm above, but not beneath. I will win and not borrow. I'm blessed going out. I'm blessed coming. Y'all ain't talking to me. I look at my children. I said, blessed are the fruit of my body. Are y'all listening to me? Ah, my eyes. See, I know they cutting up. I know they acting crazy. I know they don't seem like they got no good sense. But they come out of my body. And I call them blessed. See, here, we, here you go. Child, you sickens me. How you tell your children that? Because they make you sick. You can't talk about them. Your job is to talk to them. Whosoever says to this mountain, the word mountain really, watch this y'all, this will bless you. The word mountain in kingdom vernacular, oh boy, I love this, is unrighteous habitation. Don't you ever forget that. Things in your life that God didn't plant. Oh my God. I, oh, that's what's wrong. We got these unrighteous, you know what the Lord just said to me? I dare you, I don't care what they said, start calling your son. First of all, call him to be equipped with grace right where he is. And then call him to his assignment, number two. God, I decree his assignment is going to merge with him right where he is, and his destiny is going to be unveiled to him, and then you're going to cause him to walk out ahead of time. Did you hear that? Yeah. If you don't, didn't hear it, get the CD, and you can pick it up. He, look at Y'all point at him. Say he's going to walk out ahead of time. But, but here we go. It's on you. See, what we got to do is start treating these mountains in our life like not conversation pieces. Y'all sitting there, child, your children bad too. Yeah, mine just like that sometimes. I just feel like I'm raising baby kids. <laughs> Y'all, you ain't raising baby kids. Your kids, them your kids. Your kids worse than baby kids. If they knew you had kids, they would have had that movie about you, not baby. Them kids would have been named after you. They would have been that, your, your, your kids. <laughs> the reality is your mouth ever since you've been born again has been potent enough to change whatever is unrighteous habitation in your life you got more power than you've ever come would you tap somebody on the shoulder quit looking at me like with that tone of ice and tell them you got more power in you than you ever considered didn't God tell you that greater is he that is in you than is he that is in the world that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Here you walk around like you got the mullet grubs. That's where some of these old dances come from.
<laughs> That's where it come from. Walk around like you got the mother girls. Still your directions are bold as a lion. Somebody will stand up on your feet today. The Bible said, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Somebody shout, my habitation is changing as I stand right now. My family is getting better. Wealth and riches are in my house. I have more than enough this year. I got plenty money. I got plenty health. I got, oh, y'all better hear me. I got plenty joy, plenty peace, plenty love, plenty salvation. Holy Spirit, sir. Shh. One second. Okay. At the count of three, I'm going to give you a minute. Put what you believe, what, what you need in your house and in your life right now. Don't you be ashamed to say, if, if the person beside you is trying to hear what you're saying instead of using this fertile opportunity themselves, they don't need nothing. In fact, God, just, just dry up everything they got. I want you to act like you, you in the room by yourself, nobody but you and God. And I want you to shout to heaven for the top of your voice something that some of the things you believe in God for. See, that's what keeps happening. We preach it to you, we show you salvation, and then we do it for you. You go home and don't know what to do. But let's activate God's interest. We who have the God kind of faith, we call what, what? Be not as though it... Now, I don't care what kind of unrighteous habitation. This mountain that's in your life, you getting ready to move it now. Y'all hear me? I had a lot, I was getting ready to talk about 2020. God said, no, no, they need to know how to move mountains. They need to say, it's my time to move my mountain. I'm getting ready to put my mountain in its place. No longer will it be mine. It's going back to the hill where it belongs. It won't live in me. It will not be a part of my habitation. So on the count of three, come on. I don't know what you need. Better, better, better. The year, this year is, is the year of better. Bigger and better. What do you need bigger? What do you need better? What do you need more of? Is it health? Is it healing? Is it wholeness? Is it peace? Is it prosperity? What is it? Count of three, y'all ready yet? Somebody said, Bishop, give me a little bit more time. You ready yet? I mean, I want you to shout. I want you to carry on like ain't nobody in this house but you. Y'all ready? One. <laughs> Two. You want a husband? You want a wife? You want good children? You want a better job? You want peace of mind? You want to get healed? You want help? Y'all listen, you want a baby? You want twins? <laughs> Your triplets, quattro, 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 <laughs> quads, <laughs> better job, bigger business, better business, more wealth. Y'all ready? Two. Come on, locate it, locate it, locate it, locate it. Forget about people around you. Y'all ready? Three, go! Father, in Jesus' name, I decree blessings and favor over my life and over my house. Wealth and riches shall be in my house. I have more than enough. Will I get out the mic so y'all can stop? I have more than enough health, healing, wealth, blessings. I have the car desire. I have the, the furniture. Come on, come on, come on. 